Hello and welcome to Newsroom Series on Channels Television. I'm Olumide McCauley. Today we are in the Northwest region, but first, let's take a look at some of the other top stories elsewhere in the country. Beginning in the South South, the Port Harker Division of the River State High Court has ruled that Celestino Mejia is not a former governor of River State and as such not entitled to the pensions met for former governors and their deputies. Now, ruling on the matter brought before the court by Mr. Meher, Justice Dakatima Q, in a 97-page judgment, which took almost three hours to read, says the counterclaim by the state government demanding that Mr. Meher repay $695 million was lacking in merit, as he hadn't compelled anyone to pay him the money. Uh, though the counsel to Mr. Meher refused to comment, the senior state Council representing the state government says he was satisfied with the ruling but refused to disclose whether or not they will be taking any further action. The Nigeria Security and Civil Defense Corps, NSCDC, has uncovered an illegal refinery site in Odagwa Forest in River State, as well as arrests arrested five suspects during an operation where over 500,000 liters of crude oil was confiscated. The suspects and others who are currently at large vandalized a wellhead belonging to an oil production company, which is a few meters away from the site. Conducting journalists around the thick forest, the NSCDC Public Relations Officer, River State Command, Olufemi Ayodili, explained that the site was uncovered by the Commandant General's Special Intelligence Squad through credible intelligence. And as we indicated earlier, the Port Harcourt Division of the River State High Court has ruled that Celestin Omeha is not a former governor of River State and as such not entitled to the pensions meant for former governors and their deputies. Ruling on the matter brought before the court by Mr. Omeha, Justice Dakatima Kyo, in a 97-page judgment, which took almost three hours to read, said that the counterclaim by the state government demanding that Mr. Meher pay, repay $695 million was lacking in merit, as he hadn't compelled anyone to pay him the money. Through, though the counsel to Mr. Meher refused to comment, the senior state counsel representing the state government said he was satisfied with the ruling, but refused to disclose whether or not they will be seeking any further action. The All Progressives Congress in Undo State is saddened over the death of one of its gladiators, Dr. Paul Akintulure. He was a governorship aspirant getting ready to participate in the party's primary schedule for next month. The state chairman, Engineer Ade Adetimei, who describes the deceased as a personal friend with whom he'd had relations over the years, says the news is shocking. He was a highly refined and consistent political figure whose position was that the essence of being in politics is to build the people and the land. The contributions of the departed political leader to the development and stability of a new state tapped of APC will not be forgotten. Like other governorship aspirants who was optimistic of victory come April, he had many other plans. Death was never part of them. The state chapter sends its condolences with the, to the immediate family, the community, its political associates, and the Nigerian Medical Association. Now to our Northwest stories of the day. We begin with Kaduna State, who have moved the rescued, abducted Kuriga school children to a facility where they will undergo psychosocial therapy and counseling before being handed over to their parents. The children were taken to the center shortly after they met with the governor, Ubasani at Sir Kashim Ibrahim Government House on Monday. The arrangement, which is under the supervision of the Minister of Human Services and Social Development and the Ministry of Health, is to ensure that the rescued children are in good mental health and psychological condition before they will reunite with their families. The General Officer commanding the one recognized division of the Nigerian Army said during the handover of the children to Governor Ubasani that six out of the 137 of them undergoing medical treatment at a military hospital in Kaduna. Now, Governor Daoud Lawal has called for an increase, an increase in the number of troops deployed to Zamfara State. On Monday, the governor visited the Chief of Defense Staff, General Christopher 
Gabin Musa at the defense headquarters in Abuja. A statement by the governor's spokesperson, Suleiman Bala Idris, disclosed that the governor met with the defense chief to discuss the security situation in Zamfara State. During the meeting, Governor Lawal expressed concerns over the resurgence of attacks in some parts of Zamfara. He appealed to the chief of defense staff to deploy more troops and necessary weapons to the state. Responding, the chief of defense staff, General Christopher Gwabin Musa, appreciated the governor Lawal's efforts in fighting banditry in Zamfara, promising to continue to collaborate with the state government and residents to stamp out banditry. Now, the Zamfara state government says improving education infrastructure is crucial to enhancing the enrollment of out-of-school children in Zamfara state and ensure that all children have access to quality education. State Commissioner for Education, Science and Technology, Wadatu Madawaki, stated this while inspecting some schools undergoing renovation and reconstruction in Guso, the Zamfara state capital. He says the project is part of Governor Dauda Lawal's plan to revive the education sector with conducive environment for learning while ensuring that there will be timely delivery of the project. Dilapidated school buildings, inadequate facilities have long been a barrier to learning, contributing to low enrollment rates, poor academic performance, and overall educational inequality in Zamfara State. I declare a set of emergency on education in Zamfara State. A reason why the government declared a state of emergency on education shortly after assuming responsibilities for the affairs of the state, a move it believes will show strong commitment towards improving the quality of education by addressing the challenges facing the sector. The neglected education system in Zamfara affects all level from primary to tertiary institutions with poor learning environment and personnel. My government will give the education sector the much needed overhaul owing to virtual collapse of this sector. The state's education emergency will see 325 schools upgraded as against the 250 proposed earlier as the government. <laughs> The state government says it has spent over 12 billion naira as it continues to improve educational infrastructure and create a conducive learning environment for students. Aligned uh, with the pronouncement of the executive governor of Zamfara State, Dr. Lawal, when he declared uh, an emergency in the area of education, uh, the government is very serious about education, and that was why when the initial effort to ensure total rehabilitation, renovation of uh, schools in the state in order to ensure the delivery of quality education. A good learning environment has a way of creating positive um, learning outcomes for both question. the teachers. I'm one of the happiest teacher by seeing the schools has been innovate, renovated and being supplied with school materials. I am happy that Governor Dauda already has renovated our school. Before now, before now we used to sit on the ground to receive lessons. But now we sit comfortably and we are happy. Other issues affecting the education sector is banditry, with the government claiming that successes have been recorded in the fight, with promises that safety of schools will receive the highest of priorities. According to the state government, 168 schools that when the red zone have resumed activities with 75 still in bandit controlled areas. Nevertheless, the state government promises that soon all parts of the state will be reached to ensure a safer environment for learning. Now, Gov Governor Dowdy Lawal has called for an increase in the number of crews deployed to Zamfara State. On Monday, the governor visited the chief of defense staff, uh, General Christopher Gwabin Musa, at the defense headquarters in Apuja. In a statement by the governor's spokesperson, Suleiman Bala Idris, he disclosed that the governor met with the defense chief to discuss the security situation in Zamfara State. During the meeting, Governor Lawal expressed concerns over the resurgence of attacks in some parts of Zamfara. He appealed to the chief of defense staff to deploy more troops and necessary weapons to the state. Responding, the Chief of Defense Staff, General Christopher Gwabin Musa, appreciated the governor's efforts in fighting banditry in Zamfara, 
promising to continue to collaborate with the state government and residents to stamp out banditry. Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka, the chief, the bishop of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Sokoto, has urged the federal government to demonstrate a clear commitment to addressing insecurity in the north. While speaking with channels television during the function, Bishop Kuka questioned why individuals claiming ties with bandits were not undergoing proper interrogation by the federal government. He also criticized the president for what he perceived as an inadequate readiness to effectively address the long-standing issues of killings and insecurity in the North, which have remained unresolved for decades. It is clear that uh, the federal government at the highest level knows what is going on. At least the, the intelligence community has an idea. There are key Nigerians who are saying quite openly that they know more than we, than, than we think the rest of us know. And I think that it's a business of the federal government to find out those who claim to know where the bandits are, and those who are collaborating and cooperating with the bandits. I mean, it's the greatest humiliation of our nation. We cannot, the psychological impact on this on our children is unacceptable. So for me, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that the security agencies, in collaboration with those that they say, the people who have said quite openly, okay, that they, that, that they know what is going on. And I think the federal government has the capacity to go after those people. Mr. Kang Wandong, a Chinese businessman who was standing trial for the murder of his 23-year-old Nigerian girlfriend, has been found guilty of the offense of culpable homicide punishable with death under Section 221. Kanu State High Court has convicted and sentenced him to death by hanging. On September the 16th, 2022, the Chinese businessman stabbed um, a lady, Umu Kusumu, Buhari to death in her family house after many years in a relationship. Newsroom series and channels television coming up. Matters arising concerning the release of the kidnapped victims in Kaduna State, especially the children. We'll be speaking with a country representative, uh, representative of Medicine Sans Frontieres, Dr. Simba Terima. Please stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching Newsroom Series. Our focus is on the Northwest today. And joining me on the program is a country representative of Médecins Sans Frontières, Dr. Simba Tsirima. Good day and welcome to the program. Good day. I hope my French is uh, up to speed, Médecins Sans Frontières. Indeed. You did okay, quite so well. Thank you. I think we're, we're, I'm, I'm a bit buoyed by the fact that these kidnapped victims have been rescued, they've been released, and uh, uh, the army has kept its promise, uh, the security agencies in Kaduna State. It's reprieved to a certain degree, and we're glad that the children are, have been released. What will be the, the, the first things you look at when such victims are to be reunited uh, to their families. The families say they're under observation. Some of them are in hospital, a small number, uh, to undergo physical evaluation and mental evaluation before they're reunited with their families. What will be the first thing for your organization in these sorts of cases? Well, we're not uh, dealing directly with uh those victims. Uh, indeed, as you said, it's a relief that those kids are finally free. But uh, the first order of business is, uh, of course, maybe for those to see their parents, because I, can, I can't imagine a child uh, in, that, in captivity for, for uh, a while and not uh, knowing what will happen to them. I think it's always a relief to see familiar faces. And I, I'm, I'm also uh, happy to see that uh, such, uh, so psychosocial psycho support is being offered to these kids as well. I think that's important uh, because I can't, again, imagine what kind of trauma those children uh, have gone through. And it'll take quite a, quite a long time for them to uh, you know, come back to who they are. Uh, but again, kids are resilient. We really hope for the best. Indeed, that's the first thing I thought as well, that before the excluding physical injury, the first thing that the 
uh, which will have them obviously need uh, medical and physical uh, support, uh, medical evaluation. The first thing we'll, the children want to see are familiar faces like their parents. We hope that is in order. But now to the current challenges contributing to the upsurge of the humanitarian crisis in the Northwest. What do you think those are? Well, we've been talking about this for quite a while now, and uh, we know this. Access to health care is a big challenge. Access to food is a big challenge. Access to basic uh, services is a huge challenge, a, a monumental challenge. And the root co causes, uh, as, as uh, probably most people are familiar with, is the high cost uh, of transportation, even for some of these uh, families and children and, 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 and patients to access those basic services. We, there is a paucity of medical uh, facilities uh, near these populations as well. Uh, yeah, of course, a widespread impoverishment is, is, is something that we, we cannot uh, deny in these places. Uh, in, you know, of course, recently food inflation uh, has uh, played a key role in exacerbating these problems. And, uh, you know, of course, pr the prevailing insecurity, the, the, the issue at hand right now, uh, exacerbates all these issues that we are talking about. And, of course, we cannot rule uh, the impacts of global climate change, especially when it comes to um, the food uh, production and, 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 and nutritional uh, kinds of questions. It's one thing to be displaced in your, uh, generally speaking, but to be displaced within your own country is must rub salt into the wound. What do you make of the shelter availability for displaced persons and communities in the Northwest region? Yeah, you know, the first thing I think that goes out of the window uh, in uh, displaced uh, populations is dignity. You, you lose your security. You lose uh, the familiar settings that that uh, provide you that security, that comfort, and then not to have a shelter is 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 unimaginable. And while you know, we are not very uh, aware of uh, the shelter situation in some of the places where we work, we know many of the displaced uh, communities live in host communities or in, say, abandoned classrooms and things like this. Uh, and so it's not ideal uh, whatsoever. And, you know, come the rainy season, how do these people cope? Uh, you know, they, they are exposed to elements, they are exposed to um, the environment. And so, yes, it's, it's a major, major challenge in some of these places where uh, these uh, communities are affected and displaced. And to be obviously to be part of the solution to the problem, we know that non-governmental organizations, humanitarian organizations are in the mix. How important is it for, for there to be partnerships between humanitarian organizations like Mobilization for Safety, I believe, and the government to address the humanitarian issues in the Northwest? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's crucial for there to be a collaboration between humanitarian organizations uh, and the government uh, because the rightful owner of the problem is not uh, a people who come from outside, but the government uh, itself. MSF uh, really considered it, it consists, considered as it fundamental to collaborate uh, with the authorities in places where we work. In fact, we use uh, for the most part, um, facilities uh, that are provided uh, for by the, the state governments to provide the medical care that we do and the services that we do. So it's absolutely essential. But I'll say this, humanitarian intervention, while, it, it, while it's very crucial, is not a silver bullet. Uh, it, it, you know, because it offers sort of a, a, an immediate relief uh, and uh, supports those people in crisis at that moment but falls short of tackling the underlying issues that gave rise to those human, humanitarian needs in the first place. And therefore, you know, beyond the humanitarian uh, uh, work, beyond all these uh, uh, organ other organizations we are calling for to, to, join, to join the effort, uh, there is need, uh, of course, uh, for the rightful owners of the problem to address uh, those underlying problems. What do you think are those 
What do you think will be the solutions or the uh, short-term solutions to some of these problems? Well, I, I, I cannot speak to what the government needs to do or does not need to do. I'm very sure the, 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 the uh, governments of Nigeria are very well uh, able to address uh, sort of those uh, medium-term and longer-term uh, issues, of course, with the help from outside. But the solutions to these problems cannot come from outside. Uh, they have to come from Nigeria and Nigerians who are very, very capable of addressing those issues. What we speak to is the immediate needs that, you know, we have, for, for instance, last year, 800 and something kids dying within 24 to 48 hours of arrival to our facilities. You know, that is unacceptable. And there, therefore, there is need for immediate short-term relief uh, to address uh, those, those, those needs. But again, the longer-term uh, issues, underlying issues that precipitate what we see mm. is the purview of the, of the governments of Nigeria, federal government, state governments. And doubtless, one of those needs will be accessibility to the areas where there is humanitarian uh, support uh, that is in demand. And that obviously is a problem. How urgent is it that those areas are accessible uh, for humanitarian organizations to gain access uh, to victims and vulnerable people? Yeah, right at the beginning of the interview, what one of the things we said uh, is, look, uh, the question of access, either uh, the people in need accessing those services or humanitarian uh, organizations accessing those people in need is very, very crucial. And so one, one of the things that really hampers any activity in some of these, or can hamper activities uh, that would be helpful uh, in, 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 in providing humanitarian relief is, is access due to insecurity. Yes, it's a purview again of the, 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 the various arms of the government and the very national, sub-national governments to, yeah, to ensure that uh, they, there is access uh, to some of those places. Dr. Simba Tirima, who is the country representative of Médecins Sans Frontières. Many thanks. Thank you. Elsewhere, the, and staying in the region, mind you, the Katsina state government has assured readiness to end the spread of HIV and AIDS across the state in the next six years Precisely by the end of 2030, the Director of Planning, Research and Statistics at the State Agency for the Control of AIDS in Katsaka, that is, that is Katsaka, uh, Abdullahi Abubakar, disclosed this during the International Women's Day 2024 commemorated by the State Branch of the Association of Women Living with HIV AIDS in Nigeria. According to him, in the last quarter of 2023, precisely in November, over 20,000 people were captured to have been living with HIV on treatment. But with the new adoption of a new strategy, every client must have his data, finger, and thumbprint, amongst other identities captured. It says the current number of HIV patients on treatment in the state now stands at 16,706. Amidst high discrimination of HIV and AIDS patients, mostly in rural communities in Kassina State, the state chapter of the Association of Women Living with HIV AIDS in Nigeria joins the global community in celebrating the achievements of women and advocating for gender equality. <laughs> Members are calling on the Casino State Government and other partners dealing with HIV AIDS project to engage women living with HIV and AIDS to further the cause. A woman living with HIV and AIDS can marry someone that is not HIV positive. Yes, they have that right. Yes, so we want we want we call on traditional uh, religious leaders to preach more on that. It's allowed, and also government to empower women living with HIV and AIDS. And discrimination. Meanwhile, the chairman of People Living with HIV in Katsina State, Sheu Suleiman, appeals to members to take advantage of available medication while urging the community and government to take ownership in eradicating HIV. My advice to PLDW is to accept their positive label, to assess medication, 
that or they will be strong, they will be alive. Being a HIV positive is not the end of your life. You can live as every, everyone, as everybody. In the meantime, the Director of Planning, Research and Statistics at the Katsina State Agency for the Control of AIDS, Abdullah Abubakar, is encouraging pregnant women to attend antenatal care clinics where they also have an opportunity to know their HIV status. We want to all husbands to allow their women to attend antenatal care services in the hospitals when they are pregnant. Number two, we want everyone in Kazuna State to know his HIV status so that uh, we can disaggregate those that are having the issue and those that doesn't. And as well, we want to, because there is a national policy which is test and treat. Immediately, someone is tested positive, he should be linked to care immediately. The focus on women is born out of the month-long celebration of women globally as part of the International Women's Day. It is also a call to accelerate and value investment in women and girls living with HIV in all diversities to enjoy their rights and live a decent life. That's it on Newsroom Series today. Thanks for watching. I'm Alumide McCauley.